Coming up on Oakdale Update, we'll learn about Japanese American internment camps during World War II from an area resident whose parents endured them. And we'll get a preview of Summerfest. And we'll talk about some other upcoming events. Stay tuned, Oakdale Update is straight ahead. Hello and welcome to Oakdale Update. I'm your host, Frank Arcello. This is the city of Oakdale's news and information program about your community. Today I'm joined by John Suzukita to learn about the Japanese American relocations and internment camps during World War II. John, thanks for joining us on Oakdale Update. Thank you, Frank. Okay, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. What are you doing for a living now? So I have my own uh, business consulting uh, that I do. I've lived in Shoreview for 26 years. Okay. Well, let's start out by uh, telling us about this sordid piece of history in, in America. It's, it was one of the worst things that ever could have happened. Uh, it's equivalent almost to Nazi Germany and with the, their concentration camps. Not quite as bad, but so give us a history about the internment camps, would you? So uh, roughly there are about 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent that were interned during World War II. And, um, there were interned in various 10 different centers, mostly in the West. Um, it was mostly that West Coast of, of the U.S., Washington, Oregon, and California, uh, where the residents were interned for anywhere uh, for a few months up to about two and a half years mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for it is because the government, and they felt that the Japanese Americans would be sabotaging and, and undermining the United States government, correct? Right. The key behind it was Executive Order 9066 was, was signed by President Roosevelt mm -hmm. on February 19th of 1942. And six days later, uh, basically, the military using that executive order uh, was given the, the responsibility and the right to exclude anyone from anywhere, citizen or not, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so, but they just had, they were Japanese descent, right? Correct. It had to be. What if you, uh, I mean, it was getting off, but uh, what if you were a Japanese married to a, a white American woman or, or vice versa? How did that count? Right. I believe that they, uh, there were very few circumstances of that, of course, back in the early 40s. Sure. But um, if you were of Japanese descent, you were moved. And, and your so, wife would go too, or you're the. The, uh, that would be speculation. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just just a piece of history there. Okay. So uh, were your grandparents in the camps too? I'm sure they were, right? So at the time um, of their internment, uh, my parents were in their early 20s, and they were each interned with their own families because okay. they had met, but they weren't a couple. Okay. And so uh, both of their mothers were still alive at the time, and they were interned as well. The mothers and the children. So right? my grand, my grandmothers then were interned. Okay. Right? So. Um, what was what were they doing at the time? Your grandparents. What were they their livelihood? What were they doing? So on my father's side, uh, they owned a family restaurant, and on my mother's side, they owned a dry goods store. And uh, both of them, my father grew up in Hollywood, and went to John Marshall High School, which mm. is one of the three high schools that they filmed Grease in. So he wrote the school song. He did. And sang in the Glee Club and played football. So he he had a very. That was your father, not my father. Yeah, and my mother. So he was a young man at, when he. He had to go to the camp then? Yes, he was 22 when he went into the camps. Jesus. My mom was uh, 21, and she grew up um, on that, that part of California that swings east, and so the beaches actually face south, uh, Terminal Island, and they were amongst the first to be evacuated because after the executive order was given, uh, that was deemed a militarily sensitive area. And so they were given 48 hours to pack up their bags, sell the store, sell everything in it, and move. Now, I, I have read much about it, and um, 
didn't they, some of them, uh, turn their properties over to friends and relatives and, you know, to guard it, take care of them until they, the camp or the war was done, right? Is that correct? Yes, it ran the gamut from um, sympathetic neighbors, um, Quakers, a lot of different organizations would come in to help. For the most part, though, they had to sell and liquidate everything and were only allowed to take what they could carry. And so one of the things I brought along to show um, is a bag that belonged to my uncle, my father's brother, um, that has the camp that they went to, Granada, Colorado, and the number of the family unit that they were assigned, 18257. Oh, well. Wow. Now, there was a lot of uh, Japanese Americans that had uh, farms and or orchards, and what, what happened to their properties? I mean, did they just go? Well, interestingly, at that point in time, the first generation, so the immigrants that came over, my, my family's, uh, my grandparents, both on all four, both sides came over around the turn of the century. So mm -hmm. um, when they were, when they first arrived here and through the 40s, they were not allowed to own land. Oh. Um, so if they were farmers, then they had to rent that land. Oh. Um, so so the, they were it also, wasn't so severe then, huh? Well, they were also not allowed to, um, not only could they not own land, but they could not become citizens. And so oh. both my parents were born and raised in the U.S. and so, of course, were natural born citizens. And so um, they had to sell any property that they owned. Okay. So, uh, and you, you brought this bag down. We'll, we'll be showing that soon. Um, uh, and that's all they were able to take, like clothing and that personal items. Is that right? In that right. bag? Literally um, just what you could carry. And so, um, you know, there's just, they basically had to liquidate everything. Jeez. Okay. So where did your folks go? both sides of the family. Where did they go? Where were their camps? So my father's uh, family went to Granada, Colorado, and my mother's family went to Poston, Arizona. Um, however, on the way to Granada, my father's family had to stay at the Santa Anita racetrack, which is still there now. It's a horse racing camp, and they lived in the stalls. What was it like in the camps? Did, did, did people ever talk about that? You know, what I would like to do, uh, Frank, is relate, uh, rather than my reflection on it, is relate their words. Um, and do it. I chose some of my dad's words to reflect what was going on at that point in time. Okay, good. Following the outbreak of hostilities between Japan and America, the plate glass window of the restaurant was smashed several times. After the window was broken the second time, the insurance company canceled our policy. On December 10th, someone posted a sign on our door that read, Open Season on Japs. Jeez. This is a Jap joint. We are at war with Japan. Surprisingly, the business, the family restaurant, became busier than ever. Old customers from far away flocked in to reassure us that they considered us loyal Americans mm -hmm. and would continue to patronize our cafe. However, the federal government froze our bank accounts. The state of California revoked our beer and wine licenses and took away our sales tax permit, which meant we could no longer conduct business in the state. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we were moving, we made preparations to sell the restaurant. A buyer was found and the final transaction was made after we entered Santa Anita, the racetrack. Mm -hmm. Frank, who was my dad's brother, received a mere fraction of its total worth. Mama sold the piano for $5. I sold my Ford for $25. My brother-in-law sold his international truck for $45. Each family was assigned a family number. Ours was number 18257, and each of us was allowed to take only two bags, and those are the bags that I, that I brought along. Just unbelievable. Now, that's your dad's story, right? Correct. That's your dad's story. All right, so um, did, did he tell you, I mean, okay, well, let me ask you this. When did you become interested in, in the history of the camps and your parents' history and that sort of thing? Right. Well, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, mm -hmm. and so, as like most kids, you know, you know, you hear different things from your folks, but they didn't ever wear it on their shoulder, so they would, they would answer when they were asked, but they didn't really talk about it a lot. So I was pretty much aware of it growing up, but you know, as most, most young kids and teenagers, you, you know, it just kind of goes in one ear or out mm -hmm. the other. Um, so fortunately, my mother took the time after she retired to write a book, a non-published book, but she wrote um, not only their experiences from which I grabbed So dad and words, mom, she wrote about correct. your, your, your yep. dad too. And she, she wrote a contextual part of it, too. They gave kind of a history around it all. So I became aware of what they went through mm -hmm. uh, through that. And about two years ago, um, I'm a, I am a member of Rotary International on the local Arden Hills Shoreview Club. And I had given a talk at my club. And the members there said, you know, you really ought to be doing this more broadly. And so um, I've given it about 30 times over the last couple of years to a number of groups in the area. Mm -hmm. 
first time on television doing this? This is the first time on hey, television doing okay. this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, did the, did they talk about what was life like in the camps? What was it like? They did. <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. They did. They said basically, um, both my parents said that when they were being sent to camps, if you can imagine, um, in my mom's case in particular, they had 48 hours mm -hmm. to sell everything. And so when you're being guarded by, by guards and sent into a camp with um, barbed wire fences and guard towers with the rifles facing in, not, not out, um, they both thought that they were going to be in there for life. Um, it just felt like everything had been taken away. They were going to be there for life. And so the communities um, that developed uh, basically was a series of like barracks where uh, my mom described um, how the barracks were set up. For example, um, the, the bathrooms were just stall or stool after stool set up with no wow. privacy, you know, and there was nothing else to hang between, mm -hmm. um, between the stools. Um, so they basically said that society just Teachers taught, farmers tried to go gardens, mm -hmm. um, you know, people, Boy Scout groups, Girl Scout groups uh, developed, and people just tried to replicate their life. Although she did describe, of course, in the deserts of Poston, Arizona, of course, deserts are very cold at night and very hot during the day. Sure. And with the boards, sideboards just kind of slapped together, she said there was always sand drifting in everywhere. Sand and everything. Yep. All right. Yep. Um, okay, now, the... the uh, uh, what were the attitudes of the guards? I mean, did, you, did they ever talk about that? I mean, were they sympathetic at all? I mean, did, these guards, had to be, they're guarding civilians. I mean, that's, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so they never really talked um, exclusively about, about how they interacted with the guards, although they did say that um, they were pretty remote, right, because they were up on the guard towers. Um, there were incidents in the camps of people getting shot and killed it got too close to Jeez, the fences really and so obviously it doesn't happen very many times before mm -hmm. that doesn't happen any longer mm -hmm. um, so they didn't really describe interactions with the guards but it was it was clearly um, somebody asked me once if I thought that they were put in the camps to protect them from what was going on and um, I think the the perspective on that is that actually the guns were turned the wrong direction mm -hmm. uh, they weren't turned outward they were turned inward. Mm -hmm. So when these people came to these camps, were, was there animosity from the locals at all? Because they were, already, they were inland somewhat, you know, rather than off the coast. Was there any animosity from the locals, you know, about the, the Japanese being, it, being there? Yeah, I'm sure that there were um, one-off cases, but they were really pretty much located in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, there wasn't really the opportunity for interaction with locals. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've learned over time um, by giving these talks and talking to people who um, experienced it in a different way. So for example, I gave a talk once at the St. Paul Rotary Club and a woman there, uh, her family, her father, had actually been involved at helping the people that were interned once they were released at what to do next. And so oh. he actually got involved in the resettlement process afterward. And so. Overwhelmingly, the stories that I've heard have been related uh, were more positive than negative. Mm -hmm. So do you think even back in those days that there was a guilt, the, the Caucasians had a guilt feeling about interning the, the Japanese? Oh, there very clearly um, was. In fact, um, Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the continuous you know, bug in Franklin's ear after he'd signed Executive Order 9066. Mm -hmm. And she was the one who came and visited camps and pushed hard she did. to get I did, them I didn't rescinded, know to get the, you know, get it changed. I didn't know that. But they didn't change it, did they? Throughout the whole war, they didn't change it. No, for example, my father's family was in for more than two years. Um, and so it was, uh, there were clearly, you know, after Pearl Harbor, clearly all sorts of, it was wartime mm -hmm. type of reactions, mm -hmm. um, which, which really was kind of the culture, or the, kind of the environment. Yes. You know, I, I wasn't there, I mean, obviously, but um, I know the, the, the this, they were so, the, everybody was so afraid, you know, because of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Everybody was so afraid. That doesn't justify it, of course, but, uh, you know, I, I'm almost... Uh, I understand, and that's, that you know, wartime fear is something that, is. you know, we would all face, right? Yes. And so I think the important thing to know here is that um, it was, it's a bit ironic that the reason that they were interned was it was felt that they were communicating with Japan. Right. And the reality of it was there was never any 
any case that was ever shown where that was happening. Right. And the irony was that in the 442nd uh, combat team and the 100th Battalion uh, that actually was put together both of Hawaiian Americans, but not Hawaiian Americans yet, but mm -hmm. people from Hawaii, Ameri mm -hmm. uh, they were not a state until 59, but um, also Japanese Americans pulled from the camps who volunteered. There were a total of 23,000 that served in the 442nd and the 100th Battalion that were and still are the most highly decorated unit in, in uh, U.S. military history. And they ha were involved in a very famous rescue of uh, the Lost Battalion yes. in the mountains of France. Yes. A unit from um, Texas uh, from, was, was trapped up in the mountains. And they went in and, and rescued 211 members, and they incurred 800 casualties. Yes, they did. Who was the leader of that, Ayakawa? Uh, Ayakawa? He was a congressman? He became a congressman? So uh, Senator Daniel Inouye from Inouye, yes. uh, Hawaii was, yes. was very famously involved in that. I don't actually know the rank, his rank, and at what, what level he was he in the was military. A captain, but that's okay, anyway. But anyway, yes, uh, and they just got the snot kicked out of him when over. They were in Europe, right? They, right. Did, they were, they were uh, safely sending them to Europe rather than in the Pacific, I'm sure. Right, and actually there's a tie to Minnesota in all of this, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So the 442nd uh, trained uh, in Wisconsin, and the, um, additionally, there were 6,000 Japanese Americans that served in uh, military intelligence for the U.S., and they were sent here, uh, frankly, because at that time, and probably now, it was felt that the culture of this area would be more accepting, mm -hmm. and so they were brought here and trained, um, ironically, many of them, um, like me, didn't know any Japanese. Sure. And so they were taught Japanese so they could help in the military intelligence mm -hmm. side of it in order to... Um, Decipher codes and that kind of exactly. thing and, and messages. Uh, I think that language school was at Fort Snelling out here, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was. It was, yes. Uh, interesting, one of my customers was a, a young man in the a camp. Well, he was a young man because he was of college age. And after he'd been in the camp for six months, seven months, he got released to go to college. And he ended mm -hmm. up getting a degree in uh, uh, chemistry or whatever, and then maybe even a PhD eventually, of course mm -hmm. not. But um, so it sounds like this happened somewhat frequently. You're exactly right. Um, a number of people, uh, young adults, got released to go to college. And so my mom's story was very, uh, and your customer was very, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say common, but it was not a unique experience at all. Now this is interesting. Now who was giving them permission to do this? So um, in my mother's case, um, she was visited by a missionary whom she had gotten to know in the church that she belonged to uh, where she grew up. And so this missionary um, basically came and visited a lot and was able to obtain the release. Put a little pressure on somebody or get, get her to get out, huh? That's right. That's right. Um, this is just, a, okay, now I know Congress a few years back, and it was just day late and a dollar short, did they not give some money in, uh, to, yes. to the survivors? Yes, and so in 1988, um, in that late 80s time period is when um, Congress, hard to imagine, but they uh, unanimously um, declared the February 19th as a day of remembrance because that was the day the executive order was signed. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, they approved a reparation to uh, whoever was still living and went through the camp experiences. Mm -hmm. And so the reparation was uh, $20,000 to each survivor, mm -hmm. um, which really was um, that many years later. Um, Pittance. Uh, it, it was a, I, from my parents, what meant the most to them was the letter of apology that was signed by uh, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, president at the yes time. it was. That's, right. Yes. And so did that, I mean, I, I don't want to get too personal, but did you get money for this because you oh, were? Oh, no, no. Just your parents? Right, any uh, survivors who went through the camp oh, experience. Oh, really? Right. So if they were dead, they got nothing, right. correct? Right, <sighs> and again, 1988 or so, so roughly 43 years after. Mm -hmm. The so 20 grand was probably worth, I mean, would, uh, it was too late, a day late and a dollar short. All right, relative to, in their, their cases, sure. uh, selling and liquidating the uh, restaurant and or dry goods store. Mm -hmm. um, but like in my dad's case, um, I mentioned that they uh, have <coughs> restaurant uh, customers coming from far away and supporting them. Sure. Similarly, my mom had a great experience. Um, 
her father had died uh, not too long before that, and a Levi Strauss salesman whom my grandfather had helped when he first became a salesman oh, yeah. and helped him kind of learn the ropes. Yeah. He came back in and um, bought back everything that he had sold them at the price he did. that he had sold it to them for, which was quite a contrast in and amongst those. My mom would describe um, vultures coming in, basically flipping things. They'd sure. buy something and flip it to somebody else. Sure. Um, because there's such a short period of time they had to actually sell yeah, everything. Absolutely, under the gun. Well, John, we are out of time, but uh, I want to thank you so much for coming. I just want to, one last quick question here. Um, how are your children with this information? Do they, um, how do they respond to it? Do they, are they interested in it at all or care about it or what? Well, so I'm third generation mm -hmm. and they would be fourth. Yes. And so it, it continues to get more and more remote from yes. them. Yep. And so I think they're interested because it's something that um, our family has shared in. Um, as well, and um, my youngest son actually had an opportunity to listen to one of the talks that I gave yes. uh, at a local organization here. Okay. Um, if it's all right with you, there is uh, one thing that I would like to wrap up with because it's something my dad said. Okay, go ahead. And I thought it was, I wish I had discovered this actually when he was still living. Mm -hmm. It's particularly a poignant. Um, he said, it might be looked back upon as an experience or happening in the United States that was a result of our own immaturity as a democracy. Interesting. And I think it's a great way that basically sums up what was going on, yes. that we were and still obviously are continuing to try yes. to figure out how does a free democracy actually work? And I thought it was particularly um, interesting that after he went through two and a half years of living behind barbed wire, that mm -hmm. that was his observation and conclusion. Absolutely, it's wonderful. Very good. John, it's up to you to keep this alive. So you keep doing this. Thank you, Frank. Okay, thanks for joining us today. I enjoyed it, thank you. It's time for a short break, but first here's an upcoming event. Saturday, April 28th is the city's Arbor Day celebration. For the 43rd year in a row, the city council will hand out free trees for Oakdale residents. The Pete Grasky tree giveaway will be Saturday, April 28th at Walton Park. There are a limited number of trees, so stop by the park at 9 a.m. to get your ticket for your free tree. If you're looking for a volunteer opportunity, we have some for you. Park cleanup is the week of April 23rd. If you're interested, call 651-747-3860. To help at Summerfest Parade on June 21st, call 651-747-3866. To be an election judge, call Washington County at 651-430-6175. And finally, to help with planting at Oakdale Park on May 5th, call 651-501-5302. It's time for a short break. We'll be right back with more of Oakdale Update in just a minute. Some of today's veterans have a new battle to fight. It's unemployment. The unemployment rate of today's veterans coming home from war is 12%. That's twice the Heartland average. Tribute to the troops and the armed forces are asking for your help. Hire today's veterans. Visit PositivelyMinnesota.com slash veterans. Welcome back to Oakdale Update. The annual Oakdale Summerfest celebration is held each June at Walton Park. Here with me to give us a preview of Summerfest is our park superintendent, Jeff Kuzling. Jeff, thanks for joining us on Oakdale. Thanks Update. for having me, Frank. Hey, uh, tell us, uh, what, what's your background at the city? Um, public Works, I started uh, 2000, January I was hired, or February, excuse me. Um, worked uh, on the crew, parks maintenance, um, pretty much everything involves park maintenance, plowing, summer, mm -hmm. you know, winter really? duties. And uh, then Randy Bastier, who was the former superintendent, he retired in 2013. Mm -hmm. I was promoted up into his position. You got his position, good yeah, deal. Yeah, so... Um, Big shoes to fill. Yep. Um, so then I oversee a crew of five full-time uh, individuals for the park maintenance mm -hmm. and six summer seasonals throughout the summer. So you take care of the parks and in the building maintenance, maintenance and parks, everything. everything huh? Yeah, from grass cutting to plowing um, and everything. Everything. Huh? Yeah. Good deal. So, yeah. so how did you get into the Summerfest? Uh? Well, it was sort of uh, Randy had a him and Ted Berth had pretty much you know developed and ran it and mm -hmm. and um, he was big involved in it so I sort of stepped in and and um, he taught taught us along the way and um, they gave me the title which it's a lot of work I know I used to be involved in it somewhat as a volunteer and all that it's a lot of it work. is but I will say uh, Randy and Ted 
they made it easy. They uh, paved they, a great they road. They organized things well, they didn't did. they, for And you? it's yeah. just tweaks here and there, but sure. got to give all the credit to them. They're the Absolutely. ones who made it yep. simple for us. Okay. Hey, let's go over it a little bit. Uh, now, let's let's go through some of the scheduling for the uh, Summerfest. I'll say on Monday, the first part of it is what's yep. happening so there. So at 8 a.m., they have the, the week of June 18th, they have the medallion hunt starts. I think the, there's clues that will be released on the city's website, or you can go to City Hall and get that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be throughout the week until it's found. I, I know that it's a $1,000 cash prize. So, um, so that'll begin on Monday. And then Tuesday will be the Summerfest Royalty Coronation. And I think that's at 6.30 at mm -hmm. Guardian Angels Church. Guardian Angels Church, yes. So yeah, and, and uh, so it'll develop throughout the week. We're busy setting up the grounds, the area. Um, Thursday is, is our really big night. Obviously, the parade starts at 6 p.m., the Ted Berth Grand Day Parade, with our uh, Grand Marshal being Yours truly, Frank. So Jeez. that's that's pretty neat to see that honor. I know you've earned I, that. I just want to go back to the parade for a second here. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, it got so big they had to cut it off a little bit. They had too many. Yeah, I entrance. think there's up to 95 really? or 98 participants. Oh. And Laura Heimkees, who works up in the recreation department, she uh, has just done a great job with that. She works on that year round. Yes. So, um, they actually have to turn people away. It's, it's a fine parade. It, it is, it is and one it's of the always weather-based. We pray for 75 and sunny, but absolutely. But you never can tell. I think last year, two years ago, it got canceled yep. because of the. We had a bad, looked like two bad cells coming yeah. from the south out of Burnsville, Lakeville area, and yeah. it got to about the south end of Maplewood and went to the west. But yes. But you know, who knew? You, you yeah, did the right thing. That was the right call. Safety is what we. So what we uh, one of the things that uh, there's a lot of free concerts. Can you tell us who? Absolutely. So Thursday night after the parade, 7:30 to uh, 10, will be Gravel Roads. They're a country-based band. Uh, Friday night we'll have Uncle Chunk there from 7 to 11, and then Saturday night we'll have the Rock and Hollywoods from 7 to 11. They'll stop at 10 p.m. We have our fireworks at. 10 o'clock, weather permitting. Uh, RES Pyrotechnics puts that up. I want to go back to the Rock in Hollywoods. They have been with us since the inception of the They have been, the whole and thing, it's a they? great, they've got a big following. Um, good family band, so yeah, we always pack them in for that, and they're great to have there. They've so, been here forever, haven't they? It's been a long time. I yeah. want to say over 10 plus years, maybe yeah. even 15. So. They just kind of feel that this is uh, yep. the thing to do, huh? Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, the last, uh, well, the, the carnival rides and that yep. sort of thing. So they'll start on Thursday at 5 o'clock. Um, they'll run Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, the rides open at 5. They'll run till 11 or 12. Um, for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday is a sort of an optional day. We used to carry Sunday. Mm -hmm. They will be open on Sunday. The vendors who want to stay will stay throughout the grounds. Some can leave. Um, we always found that Sunday was sort of a lull day. Um, so the vendors were, they didn't think it was is you know profitable yeah so <laughs> um we give them the the option to stay uh, one of the things is the carnival rides unlimited carnival ride for one price from noon to just five yep there's What's that all about that's well pretty it's good deal. you can buy a band you know it's it's you'll save money kids can ride with that band they can just unlimited rides throughout mm -hmm. the day okay so it, they save money on that and i know they can pick them up at city hall too okay now the then the biggest thing is the, the fireworks yeah um that was moved from yeah, well, so we would have Summerfest, and then a week later, we're resetting everything up, and we found that there's just so many celebrations and, and stuff throughout the metro area. We were, the crowds just weren't there on the Friday, Saturdays, sure. so we tried to implement this on a Saturday night to bring families and people there, get a, you know more people in the grounds, and, and sort of tie that in versus resetting up a week later for 4th of July. Sure. And, some people liked it, some people didn't, but we had to try something to try to draw more people. But it was, uh, it's, 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 it's better, isn't it? I mean, for parking yeah, and everything. Yep, and, yep, yep. Yeah. It, it seemed to work out good. Yeah. Um, you know, there's several 4th of July celebrations throughout the metro, so it changed. Some people didn't like it, but sure. we're trying to, you know, bring more families yeah. and people to attend oh, Summerfest. It's a good so. celebration. Yeah. All right, Jeff, I think we're out of time here, but uh, I want to thank you for coming today, and you uh, filled us in very nicely. Well, thanks for having me, you Frank. Did it's a always job. a pleasure. You thank did you. a good job, and thank I you. know it's a lot of work you're putting in on this. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you for coming. Okay. Before we go, we have just one more quick reminder. Are you planning to do any spring home repair projects? The city has low interest fix up and home repair loans available to qualifying homeowners. To learn more, please call 651-730-2721. That's all we have time for this month on Oakdale Update. For everyone at the City of Oakdale, 
Thanks for watching.